Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples. My name is Martin Parks, and it is an honor, as always, to serve as your worship associate this morning. And it is with gratitude that I welcome you to this time, whether you are here in the sanctuary, watching us on Facebook at home, or sitting out in our pavilion, we are no less thankful that you are here in whatever capacity you can find. If you are new to our congregation, we are especially glad that you have found us. Our hope is that you feel welcome and that you find many ways to connect with us. If you found us online for the first time, we also hope that you'll email our administrator at office at uunaples.org so that we can let you know of all of the great things that are happening here at UUCGN. Our mission states that we are a welcoming congregation, freely seeking intellectual and spiritual growth, and that we strive to build a larger community of peace, justice, and love. Here, we learn and grow together, and we try to live our values out loud. Now I'll turn it over to Reverend Tony for the rest of this morning's welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, isn't this an interesting situation that um, for a year and a half, I was there in the sanctuary with Dan and John and a couple of other folks, our musicians, uh, in an empty sanctuary. And today, there you are in a, a wonderfully warm and welcoming sanctuary. And here I am at home. Uh, this past, uh, late this past week, uh, I was made aware that I was exposed uh, pretty directly to COVID. And while I feel absolutely fine, uh, I am uh, nonetheless keeping uh, my distance. Uh, I checked in with our reopening committee just to see how we should handle this. And this, since we already had a Zoom uh, Peace to our service today. This felt like the best way to do it. So I welcome you uh, into this space. And this morning, I welcome you into a world that's changed yet again since we last met, a world that's still reeling from pandemic and now trying to come to terms with a war in Western Europe that already has global repercussions. We are a justice and peace-seeking people with a strong aversion to authoritarianism and to the use of violence of any kind, and especially to war as a solution to anything. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. So while we haven't changed the focus of today's service, we have shifted some things to recognize what's going on in the world. And ultimately, I believe that the underlying message is relevant. As always, I want to express my gratitude for this fabulous group of people who have even made this uh, possible. Uh, I thank the staff, Anna and Stephanie and David. Uh, I thank Dan and John and the AV closet there. And this morning, I'm especially appreciative for Martin for stepping in to be the presence on the chancel uh, for you this morning. And I'm especially grateful to Abby and Sean for choosing some music this morning that connects with both the message of the day and the circumstances in the world. So let's take a deep breath and settle ourselves into this time of worship with this morning's prelude by Ukrainian composer, Stefania Turkovich, A Mountain Lass.
This congregation exists to proclaim the gospel that each human being is infinitely precious and that the meaning of our lives lies hidden in our interactions with other. The challenge we confront is to be a congregation that does not bury that great truth beneath all our business, but which enables us to encounter each other with wonder, appreciation, and expectation, to call out of each other strength and wisdom and compassion that we may never have known we had. May, the flame stir, may this flame stir our hearts and remind us of our mission to be truly welcoming, to grow in mind and spirit, and to widen the circle of peace, justice, and love. Please read or hum along as Abby and Sean offer our opening hymn, number 145, in the gray hymnal, as Tranquil Streams. The words will be on your screen. As tranquil streams that meet and merge and flow as one to seek the sea, our kindred hearts and minds unite to build a church that shall be free, free from the bonds that bind and mind to narrow thought and lifeless creed. Free from a social code that fails to serve the cause of human need. A freedom that reveres the past but trusts the dawning future more and bids the soul in search of truth adventure boldly and Prophetic church, the future waits your liberating ministry. Go forward in the power of love, proclaim the truth that makes us free. Listening to those words from afar, so to speak, uh, words written in 1933 by the Reverend Marion Franklin Ham, many years in advance, almost 30 years in advance of the merging of our two Unitarian and Universalist denominations, but how strong they are still today in calling us forward, adventure boldly and explore. I'd like to welcome into this space this morning one of our affiliated ministers, the Reverend Suzanne Fast. Suzanne uh, and I have known each other for some time now, uh, participating as we have in uh, small group, group clergy discussions, uh, really since I arrived here in Florida eight years ago. Suzanne now serves as an affiliated minister to our congregation. Um, this happened a couple of years ago. And, and basically what that means is that we provide Suzanne with something of uh, an anchor in her uh, wonderful and wide ministry uh, to, our, to our denomination. Suzanne also currently sits on the Unitarian Universalist Association Board of Trustees an important position as we consider how our movement moves forward. So welcome, Suzanne, it's great to have you with us. 
And I think it would be uh, also uh, of interest to our congregation that, well, first of all, that you, you, you served this congregation as an intern in 2008, 2009, uh, under then settled minister Katie Korb. Um, but you have a, a powerful ministry and have served this denomination well uh, in, the, in the past years um, with your work in, in, in uh, accessibility. So tell us a little bit about your ministry uh, to date. Thanks, Tony. It is so good to be here with all y'all today. Uh, it's been a little while. My, uh, my, my ministry primarily uh, is through the auspices of equal access. And so what I do is um, education and advocacy work about ableism and disability issues, mostly within our Unitarian Universalist faith and institutions. And then also I do ministry um, in the community of disabled UUs. Thank you. And, and great work because I think uh, a lot of what Suzanne has done in, in uh, collaboration with so many other folks in our movement is to create uh, a resolution that's passed that, that uh, has, has brought the attention of, uh, of this work to the wider, wider movement. So we're grateful for that. Thank you. Um, so, but you were invited here, not only to say hi to the congregation again after, after a number of years, I know you preached um, for us about four or five years ago, but um, in your role as a member of the UUA Board of Trustees, at this particular time, um, when we are looking, actually once again, at um, our principles and our purposes, asking the question, who are we and whose are we and what are we about? And um, so I, I invited you here to talk a little bit about this article. The article two of our bylaws contains those seven principles we, we tout quite a bit and those six sources that we talk about. But tell us a little bit more what you, your understanding of, of article two and why it's there in our UUA bylaws. Well, why it's in our bylaws is a good question. And it's actually one of the questions that's being studied. Um, we've, we've had in our prior traditions, we've had a history of having statements. Um, there's one that used to be well known uh, from 1887 called Things Most Commonly Believed Today Among Us. And oddly enough, the things most commonly believed today in 1887 is a bit different from today in 2022. And that's where it comes in is what, what is commonly believed among us in 2022 is we think probably a little different from what it was in 1985 when the principles and purposes that we have and have known all this long time, when those were, were adopted, there's been some minor changes and not minor in the sense that they're not important, they are, but minor in the sense that it hasn't changed the whole thing a whole lot. But this is, is living in our bylaws of the association um, in this, that spot where it usually, you know, a corporation will say, we are here to sell widgets and make money for our shareholders. And ours talks about principles and sources of our faith and, um, and, uh, the freedom of, of conscience and, and all of these things. And so that becomes part of, part of the question is, as we are here today in this time and moving into a future, what, what do we want? What do we need to guide that? Mm. And, and, and stepping, stepping back even further, we recognize that as a movement, um, we have shifted from time to time and we are unique in many ways in that that there is not one statement of belief that has existed for a long time we have shifted and we do intentionally review um, how the language that we've chosen in the past is you know works for today and so um, this was intended to be a living document um, within Article Two is also the covenantal language that's that's so essential in our tradition. Um, 
covenantal language between congregations. The, the principles themselves are part of a covenant between our congregations that hold our association together. So uh, there's a lot there to work with. And um, what, so there's this move uh, to, to look at these. What's the, there's in a commission that's in place to, to help us with this work. What's the charge to the commission? How, how, what's the scope of this? The scope is totally open, uh, including how much is, lives in the bylaws and how much might live in some other document that, uh, that they might find. But um, they've, this, the charge is, is quite explicit to, to consider it all, uh, that it doesn't need to have the same shape or form uh, or number of this is and numbers of that, all of it's open. And um, to root, for the commission to root their work in love as, uh, as the principal guiding uh, uh, force. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I mean, I know that, as you said, the, the um, the, the essence of this document, I mean, the, the article, first of all, I should let you know uh, that, that folks in the congregation have a copy of our current article too uh, in their hands. And it was attached to the Sunday news this morning. So people online could go, you know, root that out and find it. The current language as it exists. And, and most of that language is intact from when it was uh, passed uh, in 1984 and 1985, a bylaw change has to take two two sessions of General Assembly pass it two sessions to to uh, to be um, adopted. So, um, but the language in that is is for the most part intact since 1984-85. Uh, there is an inclusion paragraph in there that's important, and our sixth source. Um, the idea that we should uh, affirm and respect uh, and promote the the sort of Earth-centered traditions and their their being in touch with the rhythms of the earth. That sixth principle, sixth source, was um, added in the '90s. But for the most part, um, the the language is intact. Um, and the impetus for this now um, is, as you say, rooted in love, but but also very directly rooted in our work uh, on anti-racism, anti anti-oppression, and multiculturalism, which our association has been trying to, to sort of lift up for the last three decades um, and not always succeeding in, in living into the, the promises of that. Um, uh, and this eighth principle, which uh, was first proposed in 2013, um, but again, the piece of the impetus for looking at these, this document again. Um, you want to uh, have anything to sort of add in terms of the eighth principle and how, how this, in, you know, how that fits in? Sure. Um, so that is also part of the charge that's been given to the commission is um, that the uh, language should be uh, inclusive, welcoming, and explicitly anti-racist uh, and to draw from uh, all the work that congregations around the country are doing uh, around uh, the eighth principle. And, and, and that yeah. language is for everybody is, is that um, it says, along with the other principles that we uh, covenant to affirm and approach, uh, promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. And Paula Cole Jones, who's one of the two principal authors of the Eighth Principle, uh, is on this commission that's studying Article Two. So the work is is um, very much uh, together. And, uh, and the commission and, and the UUA board uh, are all uh, very much encouraging congregations to do the work uh, around the eighth principle because the work is valuable in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Even if uh, a few years from now, we're adopting 
a different, uh, different way of expressing these principles. And so what is the process and what's the timetable for all of this? So right now, the commission's been doing a lot of work um, uh, gathering the, the big picture information. There are four things that they've been particularly uh, asking about, uh, our shared values, what inspires us, what the purpose of our, uh, of our UUA might be, and, uh, and about covenant. And so they've been talking a lot with people about this. They've uh, had panels, they've pre uh, presented and, and had conversations going at conferences. Uh, they're starting uh, some open houses, the first one's tomorrow afternoon. Um, they've been talking with groups of people, producing resources for congregations to talk about and give feedback. There's an individual, so all these sorts of, of ways of trying to reach out as broadly as they can to get folks talking about those questions you raised. What are we here for? Whose are we? What are we doing together? And so um, that work is ongoing. And as they move further into the spring, they're going to start doing some, um, uh, oh, what's that called? When you, when you put an idea out, not because you think it's the final idea, but because you want to gauge people's uh, reactions. Right, uh, loading an idea, right? Yes, yes, uh, trial balloon, exactly. Um, so they're going to be, be offering um, various phrasings, none of which is, you know, particularly destined to be in the document, but to give all of us a chance to respond to, oh yeah, that feels good. Oh yeah, no, that doesn't feel so great. Um, and then as they get that input, they'll begin to draw it together into something that they want to propose. And that proposed language will come to the Board of Trustees in January of 2023, January next year. There'll be time then to study it, and then it'll have its initial vote at GA uh, 2023, which is scheduled to be both in Pittsburgh and online. And if passed, then as you said, this, some of our bylaws, including Article 2, require two votes. So it'll be 2023 and 2024 where those votes will happen. Okay, so that's the current timetable and, and the process. I mean, if, if you, uh, our congregation are, are uh, and I hope you are a little curious about this, you go on to uua.org, you type in article two in the search button and you will find a whole bunch of material plus all the things that Suzanne just talked about. There are workshops coming up in March and April there's opportunities for an individual survey to fill out an individual survey about um, your feelings about this. And hopefully as a congregation, as time moves forward, we will engage in this together uh, in the fall when language is floated. Um, and uh, as the sort of the, the final um, uh, report from the commission comes out in January and before next year's GA, hopefully we'll engage in that as well. So. Thank you, Suzanne, very much. Um, thanks for being with us. You'll join us a little bit later for a couple of other pieces, and I appreciate that. Let's take a deep breath uh, right now and center into our time uh, for sharing uh, and meditation with Spirit of Life. Oh, 
Sale tu compasión sobre Each week during our service, we set aside this time for community, a time we come together to share our individual joys or sorrows, and in doing so, build bonds of love and understanding. We are a welcoming community where we find connection. We are a spiritual community where we find meaning. We are a sharing community where our joys are amplified and our sorrows are lessened. Accordingly, at this time, we remember those in our lives who are struggling or who are celebrating milestones. We honor those in the wider community who are ill, who have lost loved ones, or who serve others. We hold them in our hearts. Regardless of the time you are joining us, now or later in the week, and regardless of whether you are here in the sanctuary, on the pavilion, or online, please take a moment to reflect quietly, or as I move my arm from your right to my left, to your left, speak aloud the name or names of those in joy or sorrow that you carry in your heart. And now, let us enter our time of meditation with In These Times by Reverend Tony Fisher. Spirit of life, God of our deepest understanding, we stand in awe and wonder at the gifts with which we have been graced this planet, this life, the beauty of our surroundings, shared love and joy within this gathered community. And yet in these times, we wonder at the fragility of our world. We look halfway across the globe at a country torn by fear and greed and aggression and to a people wanting only peace and stability, but who now must struggle not only for their freedom, but for their lives. Our hearts go out to these people who are making choices we hope we never have to make. But in these troubled times, who can be sure? In these times, the anxiety we see in the faces on our television screens is reflected in our own hearts, already tired from pandemic and national discord. And we too seek some semblance of peace and stability. And yet the world does not stop. The journey and the struggle continue the road goes ever on. Spirit of life and love, in these times and yes, in all times, there is work to be done. May we all be filled with the compassion, the strength and the courage to overcome our own fears and reach out with our hands and hearts in the spirit of 
gratitude, generosity, reaching out to make a difference. And may we find the power here in this community to live into our promise of creating an ever larger community of peace, of justice, and of love. Let's share some time together in silence. grateful again for Suzanne uh, in her presence with us this morning. She will share our reading this morning. And as I, even as I sit here now, recognizing the, the depth of our desire for change and inclusion, I recognize that even in the language of my meditation this morning, I used a word that I could have changed and shifted a little bit to be just as meaningful when I say standing and seeing the world, not everyone has that opportunity to do so. So I acknowledge my, my little gaffe and uh, introduce Suzanne, who will also give some introduction to our morning's reading. I think you can just go ahead. Okay, so thank, thanks, Tony, um, and thank you for modeling that uh, so beautifully. Um, yes, about this, this reading, it's a, it's a lovely reading called Borderlands by Susan Manker Seal, and it's fairly recent, and yet, even as the reading itself calls us into the future, still, 
the reading itself uses ableist and gender binary language, things that in our, our work of change and uh, uh, calling to ourselves, uh, we, would, we would do it differently, I believe, today, um, acknowledging that erasure itself is painful, especially when it's in our spiritual home. Uh, as, as it is so much in the world around us. So it is in the noticing that it can be important. So here's our reading. I am continually astounded by people who point to the struggle for the rights of African-Americans in the 1960s and say that we have done nothing comparable since. They somehow slept through the farm workers' struggles and the gender wars of the 70s, the sanctuary movement of the 80s, the fight for gay and lesbian rights in the 80s and 90s, all of which still go on today. They don't make the connection that the bravery of Rosa, that Rosa Parks showed when she refused to give up her seat on the bus is the same kind of bravery our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters must call forth just to hold hands with their lovers in public. It is the same fight. It's the same fight for respect and dignity for every human being. And it's a religious fight, a fight about what's important in the world, to love your brother and sister as yourself, and to love your God, the mystery, the universal, the spirit of life and love, the symbol of all that is good and holy in the world, that which is beyond our knowing, but is the grandest of all. To love that with all your heart and all your soul. Religions are far from infallible. There are transient elements in the way we worship, and boundaries which we cannot or will not yet see or confront as people of faith. These are the borderlands, places where we are challenged by the different and strange. What do we find difficult to see? Who among us has the vision? What revelations hover in our hearts and minds? These are the edges of the future. We yearn to see a time when war and conflict cease, where turmoil fueled by race and creed is overcome by peace. We yearn to see a world where seeds of justice flower, where burdens made by human greed no longer wield their power. We yearn to find the ground where none need stand alone, where all are welcomed, valued, loved, and know they've reached their home. So, in 1984, at the General Assembly in Columbus, Ohio, the initial draft of our current principles and purposes, Article 2, came before the assembled congregations at our General Assembly. And by some circumstance, uh, Anne and I were both there at that General Assembly. 
We were there to support some members of our youth group who we were uh, the advisors for, who wanted to go and, and see what this national conference was all about. And I was there to participate in a worship arts project, uh, a play that was written to be performed in a worship setting, uh, to perform that in one of the venues at the conference. And while we might have been a little bit aware of what was going on in uh, UU land at the time, we were sort of blown away by the energy, by the, the, the dynamism of that conference and, and all the work that was going into creating the language of these principles and purposes. And when you think about it, when you think about a democratic process of people with very different ideas of what was important. Um, and at that time we had you know, so fairly staunch humanists at the, the sort of holding fort in our, in our movement. And we had a new understanding of spirituality that came to us from the women in religion movement and from the cultural upheaval of the 1960s and, and all sorts of things happening that was creating some really interesting ideas about spirituality and about the importance of, of uh, sort of shifting the narrative a little bit. And so with all these varying uh, conversations going on and all these varying points of view, it's truly amazing uh, that the association of congregations in a democratic process was able to come up with and adopt almost unanimously in two repeating uh, sessions of General Assembly the language that you see as Article Two, mostly the principles and purposes in front of you. And it's really also astonishing how they have remained mostly unchanged. We talked a little bit about how you know some things have been added, but in in essence, they uh, they remain pretty much intact. And how much this language has been woven into the fabric of our denominational life. They are featured in our hymn book that was published in the early 90s. In fact, the hymn book is structured around our sources and, and about our principles. Uh, they have guided the development of our religious education um, since their, their adoption. Our Tapestry of Faith program built around the, the, the principles and the sources. Uh, and our young children are being taught with, through the lens of this language. Even within our, our um, associated uh, publishing arm, the Beacon Press, they have as one of their um, principles that any document that they look at has to somehow um, be relevant in terms of one of the principles or sources uh, before they consider it for publication. So given the fact that it's woven so clearly into the tapestry of who we are, and certainly we talk about it quite a bit, um, why, why now? And we talked, you know, Suzanne and I talked a little bit about this, um, but as you remember from last week, early in the 1990s, our association of congregations began to recognize clearly that we had not moved sufficiently along the path to diversity, that our, that our, our walk wasn't matching our talk. I talked about last week about two significant resolutions in 1992 and 1998 that called the association to this work. And then in 2008, uh, the, the leadership council of the UUA adopted language that said, with humility and courage born of our history, we are called as Unitarian Universalists to build the beloved community where all souls are welcomed as blessings and the human family lives whole and reconciled. Well, what's interesting about that is their choice of language, the idea of beloved community moving to the fore of many of our conversations about who we are and what we strive for. And uh, Suzanne mentioned uh, Paula Cole Jones, who's, who was uh, uh, a member of uh, the director of racial and social justice for the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, uh, and she, she began to see this, um, the existence of these two different ways of thinking 
about who we are and what we were, the, the idea of the principle so strong within our congregations and, and within our association, but also this new idea of not so new necessarily, a beloved community. Um, and that they, they represented a little bit different paradigms about who we were. Also, at that time, Paula Cole Jones and others were talking about how it was, it got, it was pretty easy for um, people who identify as white uh, to ignore the issues around racism uh, and think they were being perfectly good you use and um, aligned with the seven principles, but not having to engage with this work of anti-racism, anti-oppression and multiculturalism. So this is the time when the language of the eighth principle was developed. And again, the idea of that is we journey towards spiritual wholeness by build, working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. So it's this dynamic, I wouldn't even say tension, but dynamic that, that has spurred this current look at our Article Two language, our principles and purposes, and how we want to move forward, I think, with some more intention uh, as to how we talk about ourselves in the world. And how we talk about ourselves in the world is so critical. You know, last week I, I had a little section on language and, and taught and, and spoke to the fact that our actions can speak louder than our words. But in fact, it, it is important that we also have an ability to talk the walk as a as a, in a in addition to talking walking the talk being able to use language that that comes from our core in in settings where we are representing our values um, is critical and having language um, pro, that that we work on together as an association um, can be really powerful i know that i use our principles a lot when i'm speaking out in public and, and expressing where my beliefs come from. And it gives what I say such weight because I am expressing something from my deepest being. And so the work of this commission and of us as congregations involved in this work is to clearly create language that, that can speak to the, the larger world and express not only who we are, but allow us to express that as well. And the world changes every day. We are anxious and upset at the news from Ukraine and what's going on. And we have to acknowledge how we respond to those things as well. The invasion of Ukraine and the ongoing attacks here in, in our country on women's reproductive rights, on LGBTQ rights, on voting rights, and the rights of black, indigenous, and people of color on our public schools, all of these attacks share the same roots in authoritarianism, imperialism, colonialism that are rooted in the belief that one group of people should have authority over the decisions and freedoms of other people. This has been true through the course of our human history and especially here in our nation where whenever the state, whenever whatever state prioritizes its own ideas and interests over the agency and self-determination of the people. It creates a situation of unrest and potential violence. As Ashley Haran, organizing strategy director for the UUA wrote this week, our tradition aspires to a different kind of world. At its best, Unitarian Universalism gracefully holds at its center a reverence for both the individual and the collective. The language of Article 2 and of, of the UUA bylaws is covenantal language, affirming how we wish to relate to one another, both as congregation and as individuals. It is aspirational language that asks us to be proactive in promoting not only the inherent worth and dignity of every human being, but also the respect of an interdependent web of all existence of which we are but a part. These two framing pillars to our seven principles 
are important and are and the principles themselves are the closest things we come to a statement of faith. But how now do we do this work of articulating uh, the importance of our values out to the world? How do we do this now in 2022, 23, 24, and looking beyond? Working for a world where individual freedoms are in balance with the collective thriving, where we really think about and promote and actively speak truth to power and elect leaders who will uphold the dignity of all people and the well being of our earth and the entire human family and the family of life and what it means to work locally and globally for policies and practices that hold accountable leaders whose authoritarian tendencies tend are in opposition to our own values. There is a lot of work to do and this work can help us really ground ourselves from now into our future. Over the past few decades, our association has struggled to find our, our focus. And I think this work, um, in addition to the widening the circle uh, report that, that I spoke of last week, begins to set us off in the right direction. And as Suzanne mentioned, this is, this is work, this is re deep reflective work. It asks, what calls you here? What calls you forward? What gives you the power to make that change in your life and, and trying to make change in the world? What gives you the courage to take that journey? This is important. These are important questions. Last week, I, I gave you two definitions of beloved community. And this week, from that eighth principle, group, it says beloved community happens when people of diverse racial, ethnic, educational, class, gender, abilities, sexual orientation, backgrounds, identities come together in an interdependent relationship of love, mutual respect, and care that seeks to realize justice within the community and in the broader world. I will tell you that when I was at General Assembly in 1984, one of the things that I felt strongly, even in those moments when it, the resolution was first adopted and in the excitement of the fact that it actually had been done, was a missing word in our principles, and that word was love. And I think the work we do now centered, as Suzanne said, in that word and in the power of that word, and in the power of the feeling that we have in lifting that up as an essential glue to who we are in our relationships with one another. I think we have an opportunity to express our Unitarian Universalist values in ways that are more meaningful even than what we have today. Let me end with the words by the Reverend Dr. Sophia Betancourt. Sophia Bencourt serves currently as the Associate Professor of Unitarian Universalist Theologies and Ethics at Star, cool school, Star King School for the Ministry. And uh, just, or more importantly, she was one of three co-presidents who guided our association through a very difficult transition a few years ago. A wise and wonderful person. She said, both in this hall and across the country and globe. Our voices and values are needed perhaps more than ever before to respond to the needs of a hurting world. Our own Unitarian, our own Universalist heritage, our Universalist heritage teaches us of an all embracing love that holds us in our living, in recognition of inherent worth and dignity of all people, in celebration of the potential of every one of us and resting in the immense potential born of our connections to one another. This love lies, she wrote, at the root of all that might be understood to save us. May it remind us in the moments when we falter that we are part of a greater whole, that our very faithfulness might be key to building the world we dream about. May this love remind us in the moments when we are 
when we harden our hearts that this greater love preserves the possibility of a world shaped by justice, by wholeness, and by shared communion. May it remind us when we are weary from struggle, contention, and disappointment, that there is a larger promise of goodness and kindness and mercy that shelters us all. So may it be. As we take time to reflect on today's service, let's also take time to show our gratitude for this community and everything that it does. This morning's offering will be gratefully received. Please consider sending a contribution. The information you need to donate is on the screen. Um, today's offertory is by Ukrainian composer Kirilo Stetsenko, and uh, it's a it's an art song that we have transcribed for saxophone and piano. Um, as a result, I won't be singing the words, but I will read the translation now so that you can keep that in your mind as you listen. Um, the title is To Become the Song. I would like to become a song in this bright moment in order to fly freely around the world so that the wind would carry the echo, so that away up to the bright stars, flying with ringing song, falling on transparent waves, soaring above the tossing sea, then my dreams and my secret happiness would echo brighter than the bright stars, louder than the booming sea. Beautiful, thank you both. We take this brief moment to fill you in on any major announcements or information about upcoming all congregational events. By the way, everything you need to know about all of the ongoing activities here at UUCGN, you can find in our Sunday news, the weekly news email, or by, on, by going online to our website at uunaples.org. 
First, the reopening committee will meet again this coming Thursday to evaluate the COVID numbers here in Collier County and consider possible changes to our current protocol. Stay tuned. And secondly, the 25th season of Progressive Voices continues on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock when Janelle George, professor of law at Georgetown University, offers a timely lecture on critical race theory. And that lecture will be followed on Thursday morning with a workshop led by Brandy Anderson, lawyer, educator, and founder of the Anti-Racism Academy, a full-service racial equity and inclusion firm that serves schools, nonprofits, and Fortune 500 companies. Anderson will be focusing on the attack on critical race theory. Information and registration is available on the pavilion after today's service as well as in the newsletter. Now, you certainly may. Thank you. From the 3rd until the 20th. On a Sunday after the service. Please make that note. Um, or just wait for the next newsletter update and you'll get it there. So, but it's all right. So it's not quite as soon. Now, please stand as you are able for our closing hymn, We Are Not Our Own. Feel free to hum along for the, to the words on the screen and please remain standing for the benediction. Justice willing and aware Give to earth and all things living Liturgies of care Let us be a house of welcome Living stone upholding living stone Gladly showing all our neighbors We are not our own, not our Closes the, with these words adapted from David Blanchard. We must do more than simply keep the promises we have made in the past. We must do more. We must keep promising. New things, deeper things, vaster things, things yet unimagined promises that will be needed to fill the expanses of time and love. We must, must keep promising. promising. Go in peace. Go in love. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>